The zero running back strategy is a tough one. I'm sure you guys are getting your keyboard soldiers ready to yell at us in the comments already just by me uttering the sentence, the zero RB draft strategy. Today, we're going to break down your one-stop shop for everything zero RB. Let us know in the comments what you think of this breakdown. Subscribe if this is the first time you're checking us out. But essentially, structure this video. We've been doing it for a couple of years now. We start by defining zero RB for those of you that are new, why it can be effective, uses, things of that nature. Then we're going to go through the running back dead zone, which has taken a little bit of a new look in recent years. Then we're going to go over when to use a zero RB, so the types of leagues as well as the scoring settings that you want to use it in. And then at the end, we're going to demonstrate how to use a zero RB in a mock draft where both of us are picking from either sides of the board. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with the zero running back draft strategy, basically the premise of the strategy is fading the running back position till at least round seven, round eight of your drafts. Uh, during the first seven, eight rounds, your goal is to win at quarterback, wide receiver, and tight end, building up some significant edges to your league mates and being able to backfill at your running back position. The reason why you're going to want to do this is that the premise of it is wide receiver, quarterback, tight end more talent-driven positions, whereas with running back, like we see every year, there's a lot of out-of-the-woodworks types of options. Your Kyron Williams is your Zach Moss is even of last year. A lot of running backs that will have relevance throughout the fantasy season. It's up to you to be able to find those running backs off of the waiver wire and late in your drafts and potentially field in some competitive running back rooms. One of the biggest winners for a zero running back draft strategy, for example, last year was a guy like Raheem Moser, led the league in rushing touchdowns with 18, was able to finish as a top five running back despite going outside of the first 10 rounds of ADP. Yeah, and I mean, the reason you're doing this is because you're going to be weaker at running back, but you're going to be stronger at quarterback, wide receiver, tight end, and through your flex positions, knowing that the thesis of this entire strategy is based around the fact that running backs inherently get injured more than those other positions. They're a lot more, you know, kind of unpredictable in terms of, uh, you know, touch workloads and things of that nature, like you said. And because you didn't invest heavily into the running back position, your team should get stronger as the season goes along. If you're in a home league draft and you have a bunch of wide receiver, quarterback, tight end, and flex talent, and your only goal off of the waiver wire is to collect running backs that can fill your lineup, then that's what your entire fab budget is devoted to. And as the running backs are getting injured in your league mates lineups, you're grabbing their backups, you're grabbing their handcuffs off of the waiver wire. And to prove that running backs do in fact get injured more than other positions, we can see the top 20 running backs in ADP since 2015. The average games missed over the last couple of years is 3.08. You got a 19.44% chance of them suffering a serious injury, meaning they miss six or more games in that span. As opposed to the wide receiver position, you're missing 1.82 games on average, 11.7% chance of them suffering a serious injury. So with these two positions, again, the, the hero and zero and double hero strategies are all based around how you handle the running back position. And in a zero strategy, you're going to forego that risk altogether by drafting none through the first seven to eight rounds. The way we approach the running back position as a whole is from an opportunity cost standpoint. So the thesis, like you said, of the zero running back draft strategy is that Running backs in your league are going too high. Running backs in your league are a premier asset, according to a lot of your league mates. So instead of investing early on maybe lower projections, you would rather wait, get some better projections later on. And because of uh, you have all of these other positions locked down, whether it's, you know, a Josh Allen type at quarterback or you have a Mark Andrews slash Sam Laporta at tight end, being able to get elite options at wide receiver, quarterback, and tight end puts you in a good spot where, like you said, if you hit on the next Kyron Williams, you're going to be able to take advantage at both quarterback, wide receiver, tight end. And now if you hit on a Kyron Williams, also have a strong advantage at running back just with lower opportunity costs relative to the rest of your league. Yeah, and the reason you're doing that is because all of your league mates are projecting the running backs up the board, and you're simply drafting the best player. Zero RB is a reactionary strategy. It's not that you want to go into a draft saying, I'm not going to draft running backs. You're doing it because when you get on the clock, every single pick is not a running back is the best available player because your league mates are drafting them way higher than you're willing to draft them. So you go into this draft ready to just take the best player available, and you use zero RB as a tool in your tool belt because your league mates are deciding that the RB 15 in ADP should be going ahead of the wide receiver 10, who you think is a better projection. Ergo, you just take best player available. It could be a wide receiver, could be a quarterback, could be a tight end, could be a, a wide receiver for your flex spot. Whatever the case is, that is why you're fading the running back position. It's not necessarily totally driven by the fact that you think they're overvalued and um, they get injured more. It's more that you just prefer the projections of the other players on the board. Exactly. And the reason why a zero running back is extremely effective for a strategy is that, like I mentioned throughout the video, 
running back is an opportunity based position. So therefore it's a lot easier to find running backs coming off of the waiver wire running backs coming later in your drafts, because quite simply, if a running back gets hurt, the next running back in line is set to take on a 17 touch 20 touch per game type of workload and give you RB 15 plus level production at the wide receiver position. It doesn't simply work like that because as we know with wide receivers as a whole, it is a talent based position. Therefore your targets are earned. You can't just go out on the field and replace Devontae Adams. You just can't go out on the field, replace a guy like CD Lamb, replace a guy like AJ Brown, because quite frankly, those guys are one of one talents. The running back position as a whole in the NFL is a lot more dispersed with talent in the league. Obviously, of course, you're going to have your Christian McCaffrey's, your B. John Robinson, your Brees Halls. We're drafting those guys high for a reason because their ceiling is evidently higher than the average of the rest of the running back position. But once you get into round four, round five, round six, and you're not dealing with extreme talent outliers at the running back position, you're better off waiting for the guys that, while they don't have as crystal clear of a projection later on, do have the same relative range of outcomes if they are to get that type of volume. Yeah, and we're going to go through a mock at the end of this to show you exactly the types of targets we're after. And of course, you can get our draft guide by hitting the link in the description um, to get our actual player takes on players that we're going after. But the other major component that interacts with why you want to deploy a zero RB is because you want to bypass the running back dead zone. Now, the dead zone is also one of these topics that gets people all hot and bothered in the comment section because it is a very intriguing concept, particularly this year, because year after year, we're getting better and better values at the running back position during the running back dead zone in sharper rooms. The dead zone in your home leagues typically starts around running back 16 through running back 20 in running back ADP around the fourth round and kind of ends around round seven when 24, 25 running backs have been taken in the draft. But again, this is changing every year. As you can see on the screen right now, the win rate for dead zone running backs previously was 30, 40% of the time at best you were hitting on a dead zone running back. And then last year, that number spiked at 50% because we had better production profiles in the dead zone than we usually do. But even despite that, the wide receiver still outperformed the running backs in the dead zone, hitting at a 55% rate. So yes, running backs in the dead zone are performing better now because we have sites like Underdog Fantasy, which are making even home leagues like the ones you and I play in a lot sharper. And people aren't drafting Miles Sanders and Alexander Madison like last year. People would have been drafting those guys five years ago, two or three rounds earlier than they were drafting them last year. And same goes for guys like Zamir White, not even going in the dead zone. He would have been a fourth round pick three years ago if we were looking at it. So seeing some of the dead zone running backs last year and the ones that hit Alvin Kamara, Rashad White, Travis Etienne, James Cook, James Conner, DeAndre Swift, Joe Mixon, David Montgomery, Isaiah Pacheco. We had a whole video on the archetypes of running backs to bet on the in the dead zone. And a lot of these guys fit the archetype of decent bets in the dead zone. So if you do want to venture in here, that's obviously a modification that you can make to the strategy. But for the most part, the thing to keep in mind that I keep coming back to is that in the round eight to 10 range, so just after the dead zone, running backs hit since 2018 at a 44.64% clip, which is actually higher than the hit rate during the dead zone, almost 10% during rounds four to seven. And the reason for that is because it's less of an investment that you're putting into, say, just a volume play like Zamir White. He doesn't need to do as much if you're around nine pick as opposed to if you're around four pick. If you're around four pick, you're one of the best players, presumably, on your fantasy roster, and he needs to produce like one of those players. But if you get him around eight, round nine, like some of the volume plays you can get this year, the Bengals running backs, things of that nature, you're getting a much, much better um, path to success because they don't need to be a 15, 18 point per game score to pay off that price tag. They can give you 13 points per game in round nine and wide receivers are hitting at about the same rate, just 1.7% of the time round eight to 10. So the reason we still want to bypass the running back dead zone is because even though last year it overperformed, there's a very good chance. A it's not going to do that again. And B the wide receivers were still a better projection, especially the quarterbacks and tight ends this year. Also very good projections there. Yeah, and I'm glad you mentioned the caveat. Obviously, we'll talk about, you know, modified strategies once we specifically get into zero or uh, hero RB and double hero RB because the dead zone isn't as dead as it's been in the past. And we talked about that in the dead zone slash bet zone video where a lot of these profiles that we typically see in the dead zone aren't quite as existent on today's market. However, that's more so talking in the frame of underdog ADP. A lot of you guys in your home leagues, you're still going to see, you know, your Joe Mixon's going in the third round. Or if I'm going through ADP, like Najee Harris may be a fifth round pick. Uh, Aaron Jones may be a fourth round pick. In a lot of your leagues, the comfort of the running back position 
drives the market. Whereas with underdog, like we see continually, because people are so wide receiver thirsty. Again, we'll talk about an example of how to do a zero RB on an underdog and compare it to what it may look like in your sleeper ADP, your home league ADP. But you will get structurally different rooms based off whether you're doing it in a sharp league versus potentially your home league with your buddies. You know, you're drinking on uh, Labor Day, you're having a good time, and the one guy drafts four running backs at the turn. <laughs> yeah, people do that in my home league, even though my home league has gotten sharper. So it isn't yeah. even necessarily to say your entire league will behave like this. But if the vast majority of your league is behaving in a way that they don't want to overinvest in running backs early, that's a sign that your league is gearing more towards the underdog side of things as opposed to the side of things that people used to draft like in 2018. It was like, you better get two running backs to start your draft or you're going to be left holding the bag at that position. Yeah, the, the most scarce position is one that still rings in my mind in the late 2010s. Everybody was just talking about drafting running backs early. Otherwise, you wouldn't have running backs. And we are seeing the overall dynamic of the market uh, flipping. But the last caveat I will say is when you do con conduct a zero running back in your home league, if they love running backs, make sure you don't fall in the trap of just continually drafting wide receivers in the late rounds of your draft. Once you're in rounds 10, 11, 12, and maybe there's some wide receivers that you still really love on the board. At some point you do have to draft running backs. Like people may just leave their draft with three round 10 plus drafted running backs. At that point, you're too far behind the eight ball. So I will say if you do choose to go zero RB, you have to make sure that you backfill at the position appropriately. And you're going to have to bite the bullet. At the end of the day, you will need running backs on your roster and you're just doing it at a later opportunity cost than the guys that are taking them, you know, rounds four or five, six, seven, et cetera. Yeah. So ultimately it's up to you guys to determine whether or not your league is conducive to something like a zero RB to build, yep. or if it's not, because if it's not, you play in a sharp league and people understand they shouldn't overvalue Najee Harris types, then you're probably not going to have as much success operating a zero RB. But like I said, if you play in a bog standard home league where people don't follow content, don't understand at all that the zero running back landscape even exists in the first place, then uh, you're probably going to be effective deploying this strategy. So let's talk about some myths about zero RB and we can kind of rattle through these. Myth number one that a lot of people like to say is that it doesn't work. It, zero RB never works. You got to get the most scarce position in fantasy football. I'm sure somebody is going to the comments right now and commenting that it doesn't work and it can't ever work. If you guys are diehard running back truthers, you you might be thinking, how can this possibly be effective? Because it is so hard to fill out your running back core unless you get them early. And that's maybe true to some degree. If you want to get a hammer running back early, by all means. But the reason that this strategy can be effective and the fact that it literally won Best Ball Mania 4 last year, the biggest fantasy contest in fantasy football history, I don't even think it was executed perfectly. And you can see no. that Amin, who took down Best Ball Mania 4, won $3 million playing fantasy football is because he had horse wide receivers. Amon Ross St. Brown, C.D. Lamb, Amari Cooper, George Pickens, especially Cooper and Pickens, those guys really performed in the money weeks, week 16, week 17. He didn't even have a great tight end core. Like he had Pat yeah. Fryermuth, Sam Laporte. I mean, Sam Laporte obviously was great, yeah. but it was a three tight end build. And, you know, sometimes that's suboptimal. He had three quarterbacks, some of which were unstacked. He got Tua Tungavailoa, Jordan Love, and then a naked C.J. Stroud there at the end. So, I don't even think he did this necessarily the most effective way, but the reason he was able to pull off a zero RB and has $3 million in his bank account to show for it is because he got absolutely basement price tags on running back production. He gets James Conner, DeAndre Swift at the tail end of the RB dead zone. Like I said, three years ago, those guys would have been going way higher than they were going last year. And then you also get those real basement price tags on Raheem Mostert, who was a league winner, on Shuba Hubbard, who gave you some good weeks. And then obviously Kyron Williams, the biggest league winner in all of fantasy at the running back position last year. So again, zero RB, does it always work? No, definitely not. And that is the second myth of zero RB, but it can work. Think of zero RB as a tool for your fantasy tool belt. I said that earlier on in the video, you only want to deploy it when it's necessary. You do not want to go into a draft saying, I'm going to do a zero RB now because it's the best strategy. It's the only answer. It is still mighty effective in home leagues on your work buddies, but in sharp rooms like underdog or even home leagues that you and I play in, people are starting to catch up. It's a little bit less effective than it used to be. Wide receivers, quarterbacks, and tight ends. You're competing for those great values now. You were never competing for them before because your league mates were hammering running backs, but now those guys are not just falling in your lap. And also too, the waiver wire is a lot harder to compete for running back production on. If everybody's running zero RBs and hero RBs, you're not just getting the best waiver pickups every single week because your league mates are focused on streaming tight ends or streaming quarterbacks or getting wide receivers. Yeah, 100%. And the takeaway you guys should come away with is that 
when you do use a zero running back, you only really want to use it when about, you know, 75% of your league mates are overvaluing the running back position as a whole, because like Corey just said, the dynamic in your leagues, you kind of want to zig while everybody's zagging because that ultimately gets you the best values when you're weak at a certain position, whether you're weak at in a zero running back draft, draft strategy at the running back position, you don't want to be competing for those same running back profiles. And like we'll make reference to with the hero, the double hero that also applies to those strategies as well. It's up to you to know your league rules. Is it a three wide receiver, two flex league? Is it a full PPR league? Are there big play bonuses? There's a lot of determining factors in your league uh, market to base what strategy to conduct. Again, we're not going to say draft a zero running back team when it's a two running back, two wide receiver, one flex league with you know standard scoring settings. You have to know which league to be able to apply the strategy to because you do want those wide receivers. You do want those onesies to hold a significant advantage. Yeah, so again, great rule of thumb is if you play in a league where you can start up to three wide receivers, it's a full PPR league. Maybe you have a tight end premium or if it's a super flex format, it, zero RB is going to be way more effective for you than a, like you said, two wide receiver, one flex standard league. Like I would not recommend to deploy a zero RB in that type of format, even like a half PPR, two wide receiver, two running back, one flex standard settings on ESPN. It's probably not an optimal strategy. You're probably better off running a hero or a double hero running back strategy at that point in time. So again, know your league settings, really understand how the scoring is going to interact and how the dynamics and the behaviors of your league mates are going to bring up if zero RB is a tool that you even want to bring out. Because like I said, if it's not a good environment for zero RB, it is not for every league format. For sure. And we will be doing examples over on Sleeper. So if you guys are playing on Sleeper, you can kind of get a feel for what a zero running back team would look like in a Sleeper room. Again, You'll see what the running back valuations are. You'll see what our overall structure will end up leading itself to. If you guys are over on Underdog Fancy, if you haven't already used promo code FSC on first deposit, you're able to see that this is what a zero running back would look like in a underdog centric room. A lot of wide receivers are going early, but if you're able to stick to your structure, you are left with some good teams. For example, in this draft particularly, I was left at the 112. You're actually in this draft at the 101, kind of performing your own hero running back, which I'm sure we'll get into uh, at a later a later video. But with this 112 pick, Garrett Wilson, Marvin Harrison Jr. was able to get that quarterback advantage there with Josh Allen. My quarterback won in my rankings, was able to grab T. Higgins to get my third wide receiver. Another advantage at a onesie position there with Kyle Pitts, a guy that I believe can be a top three overall tight end. And then backfilling there with guys like Roma Dunze and two correlation pieces to my Josh Allen with Keon Coleman and Curtis Samuel. And if you were to talk about how I landed the plane at the running back position, early season thumper, a guy like Brian Robinson that can give me some early season production, Tajay Spears, young upside, Jerome Ford, potential early season appeal with Nick Chubb coming back from the knee injury, Tyler Algier, high priority handcuff, JK Dobbins, another upside piece at the running back position to potentially be again, not without risk, but a guy that has the opportunity to be a top 12 Top 15 overall running back should he stay healthy. Cole Herbert, again, another high priority handcuff. And then in the last round, was able to grab Isaiah Davis, that a guy that I just think is a talented running back that may work into it. So this would be landing the plane. Again, typically on underdog, if you don't draft running backs early, you want to have at least six or seven running backs in your team structurally. But I like how I was able to build this team. Having the advantage at quarterback, having the advantage at tight end, obviously at wide receiver as well. And still picking up pieces at running back that I think can give me production. Yeah, absolutely. Like you said, that's kind of the example of how it plays out in a sharper league. You can build yeah. way better teams than the one that you just built. If you execute this in a home league where your oh, yeah. league mates have no idea how to value the running back position correctly. So let's snap into the sleeper draft. We're going to basically jerry rig it so that it is a conducive zero RB atmosphere. The league scoring settings are such that it could be a good zero RB and we'll probably um, maneuver the board a little bit as well. So let's get right into that. All right, so we are now into the draft. Like I said, Danny's going to be picking from the early pick slot. We're going to both be executing zero RBs. Again, keep in mind that you don't want to go into a draft saying I'm going to execute a zero RB. We're just showing you guys an example of what a zero RB looks like properly executed. Hopefully the values fall to us to the point that it actually works out, but we're going to just basically show you the structure and things of that nature. If you do want like player take stuff, like which players we would take at each pick and things of that nature, uh, that is available in our draft guide, which of course you can go to underdog fantasy, sign up with 10 bucks using the promo code FSE. And that will be linked down below in the description. You'll get our draft guide sent to you via email within like 24 hours. If you already have an underdog account. Of course you can get it on our site, flockfantasy.com promo code FSE over there as well. So we're going to start the draft. Danny, you are on the board here. You are presumably going to go with your number one ranked wide receiver because we are repping a zero RB and also just the player you would go with, which is the point of zero RB. It's like we're drafting the best available player. 
100%. Again, CD Lamb is my first overall ranked player. Comment down in the comment section how wrong that take is. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of running back truth. There's a lot of high T bros in the comment section of this video. But all jokes aside, I mean, CD Lamb is a crystal clear projection, 25 year old wide receiver. And again, not to get too micro takey, but he is my first overall player. So I will take him here. Yeah. And we'll go through the first, I don't know, six, seven, eight rounds after the dead zone in depth. And then we'll kind of just skip ahead to the end and talk about exactly um, how the, um, how the strategy plays itself out. So you guys can see again, probably not the most conducive to a zero RB right now, because in a, a bog standard, you know, home league, maybe that Jameer Gibbs is off the board already. Maybe Jonathan Taylor's off the board already because people just need them some running backs. But I do get a guy who falls to me, who is my best available projection, who is not at the uh, running back position. So I'm going to take Garrett Wilson here. So after I take Garrett Wilson, I'm back on the clock. And again, we're taking the best available player. That is the purpose of executing a zero RB. I'm not trying to execute a zero RB. Again, I am kind of for this, the purposes of this video. But if I was in an actual draft, I would look at the board and be like, okay, what is what makes sense to absolutely you know pick at this point? To me, my highest available rated player is Marvin Harrison Jr. So I'm starting with two straight wide receivers to start off this draft. So after I go Garrett Wilson and Marvin Harrison Jr., we did kind of jerry-rig the board a little bit because we want to make it seem like this is a conducive atmosphere to the zero RB build. Again, that's why we're executing it. So Danny, I mean, you would have loved to get Devon Achan or Travis yeah. Etienne potentially to anchor your running back core, but we're creating a conducive environment for a zero RB. So I'm assuming your highest rated player is probably not a running back at this point. Don. Yeah, for sure. My highest two rated players left and uh, they are actually two wide receivers there with Brandon Ayuk and Nico Collins. Like you said, uh, if a guy like Devon H and, you know, Travis Etienne, possibly Kyron Williams were to fall in this instance, knowing the dynamic of running backs in the draft, you may go with them. But with all the being off the board, not really seeing a running back that I want to take at this 2-3 turn, I will go again with my two highest rated players of Brandon Ayuk and Nico Collins. Again, I can start all three in my lineup here with the two wide receiver, two flex league, full PPR, and I have really three workhorses that could potentially all finish as wide receiver ones this year. Yeah, for sure. And I'm back on the clock here again. And a lot of the running backs that I would have maybe liked to get, Isaiah Pacheco specifically, do go off the board. So again, I'm going to my best available player. And another thing to keep in mind when it comes to the zero RB draft strategy is that you do typically want to win the onesies. You want to try and get an elite quarterback, an elite tight end, because you're not deviating in the dead zone for running backs. You have the ability to deviate for those other position groups. So my highest available player, uh, best available player right now is actually between these two wide receivers, Jalen Waddle and Mike Evans. I already have two locked and loaded number one wide receivers, but I have a little bit more offensive question marks about Garrett Wilson and Marvin Harrison. So I'm going to pass on Mike Evans, go for Jalen Waddle, a guy I know who is an absolutely dominant offense. And I have no worries from that perspective. So I'm now back on the clock here. Again, do I want to go with a, I was actually hoping one of Lamar Jackson or Patrick Mahomes yeah. would fall back to me. They don't in this instance. So what I'm going to end up doing I already have Marvin. Do I want to grab Trey McBride and go for the Cardinals onslaught? I think I'm actually going to take one more wide receiver, knowing that I already have Wilson, Harrison, and Waddle. Again, we're trying to win our flexes. In this league format, you can see it up here. Two wide receiver, two flex, full PPR. So ideally, you probably want to have wide receivers through your flex positions, and I could take another one of these guys maybe in a good offense like Devontae Smith. Maybe I want to go for another true alpha number one like Malik Neighbors. I am actually going to go in the direction of a guy who can give me big plays and high PPR value. So I'll take DJ Moore there at the 403. Any one of those players is like, honestly, throw them up in a hat. Metcalf, even Malik Neighbors and Devontae Smith are all very closely rated for me. But like I said, I start my draft with four straight wide receivers. Hopefully I can uh, hammer out some onesies at my five and six turn. For sure. And uh, coming back to me at the 412, I would have liked any of the top tight ends to make it back. One did end up making it back with Mark Andrews. So he will be one of my picks. And then in terms of the wide receiver position, would have preferred, you know, a Malik Neighbors, DK Metcalf, you know, D Devontae Smith to fall back. But at the same time, I still feel like there's a couple wide receivers here that I do like at this 4-12-5-1 four, uh, four, valuation. I will go with Mark Andrews as the first pick. Again, feels a little bit early to grab the onesie at quarterback with Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson off the board. Don't really value any of these other guys at the 5-1. So I'll still continually build my wide receiver depth. George Pickens, a guy that has been flashing a camp, a guy that I can have as my boom bust wide receiver for, but still have a legitimate top 15 level season. A guy that in his second year had over 1,100 receiving yards. Being able to get that at the 5-1 to be, like I said, as my fourth overall wide receiver, still filling in my second flex does feel nice. 
Yeah. And again, it, it doesn't matter necessarily which player archetypes you're going after. You do want to kind of keep in mind the ones you've already drafted and how they interact with each other. That's kind of what my rationale was for taking Jalen Waddle over Mike Evans. But you could have gone Amari Cooper there. You could have gone with T Higgins there if you wanted to. So I'm back on the board. And I do believe that Anthony Richardson is absolutely a screaming value on the clock right now. But I also yep. really love George Kittle. So I guess I'm going to play the ADP game knowing that these two guys already have quarterbacks and they're probably not likely to take Anthony Richardson after my selection. So I'm going to take Kittle first and hope that Richardson does fall back to me. And I'm sure he probably will. So I end up securing my two onesies here with Anthony Richardson. Again, we're going to look at the running back board because again, we're not actually saying I want to go zero RB here, but to me, I value Kittle and Richardson well over guys like James Connor, Deandre Swift, Aaron Jones, the yeah. running backs that were available for me on the clock there. So that's what the direction I'm going to go in. I have basically a league winning upside at all of my non running back positions. I think any one of Wilson, Harrison, Waddle, or more could have high end wide receiver one seasons, George Kittle, high end tight end one season, Anthony Richardson, high end QB one season. So that is where you're getting all of your upside from. And as we talk about what we're basically getting out of the RB dead zone, or we're starting to just based on the archetypes of running backs on the board. And we're going to hopefully get into uh, guys that we can actually start to venture out of the dead zone for. For sure. And you mentioned getting a, a quarterback advantage there at the, uh, with the Anthony Richardson pick at 6-3. Really like that pick as well. My next rated quarterback, again, like if that had Dak fallen, you could have made the case getting Dak to pair with CD Lamb at my 101 for that stack. Obviously, as we know, the value of stacks, you're making a consolidated bet on an offense. Uh, and it's good to make that type of bet on an offense like uh, that projects like the Cowboys. But my guy that I have rated here as the highest graded quarterback and a guy that I think is a really good value at the 612 is actually going to be Kyler Murray. Again, looking back, maybe if McBride had fallen, that would have worked out even better for me. But getting an advantage both at quarterback and tight end, both guys that I think have legitimate top three to five level projections at their position. Kyler a little bit uh, further down the board, but like we saw from you know 2019 to 2022 on a per game basis, Kyler Murray is one of the best quarterbacks in fantasy football when he's healthy. So getting that at the 612, I'm all for it. Now, like you said, you may look at the running back board guys like you know Ramondre, Najee, Tony Pollard, etc. are the top of the board by ADP. Uh, but a guy at wide receiver that I really like in this position because again, he's got some question marks, he's got some uncertainty coming into the year, obviously, with the offseason reports on him, but Getting a guy like Rasheed Rice attached to that Patrick Mahomes Chiefs offense here at the seven one to be my fifth wide receiver again. I don't need to. I don't need him to be a consistent producer in my lineup when I got guys like Lamb, Ayuk, Collins, and Pickens, and he's the ultimate boom bust profile at that point at the seven one. Yeah, and you might be thinking, why would you not take a running back at that point? All of your non running back positions are filled out in your lineup. You got two wide receivers, your two flexes, your tight end, your quarterback. I would say this would be the first point that you could deviate for a yeah. running back if you wanted to in a zero RB because, like, maybe you loved Ramondre Stevenson on the board where Danny was picking, and that's who you could deviate for. But at the same time, we're trying to win these other positions and having a reserve guy like Rasheed Rice who could have an extremely, extremely high ceiling to make your lineup and make your team better. That also makes a lot of sense because in a zero RB, your goal is to win every other position and then backfill running backs in the late in the draft portion, as well as on the waiver wire. So I'm on the board here. I'm at the tail end of the RB dead zone. This is probably the time where you could take a running back reasonably, right? You want to take a running back maybe late in this part, get a Tony Pollard, get some guaranteed touches. I'm looking at the overall projections and I, I actually don't view the running back position as the best position on the board. So what I'm going to end up doing, I feel pretty comfortable that if Pollard, if Brooks, if Javante, if one of these guys falls back to me, Jalen Warren into the round eight area, that's the direction I'm going to go. I'm going to do what you did basically, which is get one upside swing to go along with my four wide receivers. And I'm going to grab Lad McConkey, who is ripping up training camp right now. And I do believe he has a chance to be the number one receiver there for the chargers. Again, player take wise, not overly important. You could have taken Keon Coleman or Brian Thomas or Jackson Smith and Jake, if you prefer them as upside swings, but I do feel pretty confident knowing that McConkey doesn't have to play right away for my team. And he might already be a starter for the chargers and have super high upside from that perspective. So what I'm going to do here, and this is a hard thing because a guy like Jonathan Brooks, you think about what he could represent for a zero RB built. He could unlock a zero RB, right? You think about what Jonathan Brooks could be when healthy, could be a Rashad White, James Cook caliber projection that you get in round eight because he's he's injured right now. So zero RB type of target like Jonathan Brooks, if you feel confident that you can backfill that production later with like Devin Singletary, Ezekiel Elliott, early season play types, Chuba Hubbard, Gus Edwards, guys like that, then you could take a guy like Jonathan Brooks here. What I'm going to do is I actually view 
based on the news and some of the stuff we've heard coming out of camp, I actually view Javante Williams as the better projection. So I'm going to grab Javante Williams, but I do think that Jonathan Brooks has a chance to be a, an unlock, you know, skeleton key for zero RB builds. And after uh, Danny makes his two picks here, we're going to simulate to the end of the draft, show you guys, we're going to make the picks obviously, but we're just going to skip ahead to him and kind of give you guys the rationale for the late round picks that we made. That's praying Brooks fell. <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell uh i'll go warren and spears probably all right so this is the end of the mock again we were showing you guys exactly how to properly execute a zero rb so looking at my team garrett wilson marvin harrison jalen waddle dj moore george kittle anthony richardson lad mcconkey those were my first seven picks i filled out my two wide receiver spots my two flex spots an extra wide receiver in reserve and a elite quarterback and an elite tight end advantage after that, you pound really an ambiguous backfield with the Javante Williams pick, a safe volume projection like Brian Robinson, an upside swing volume projection like Chase Brown, a total swing for the fences in J.K. Dobbins, a rookie with Jalen Wright. The one guy that's cut off there is Damian Pierce, who's obviously just a handcuff to Joe Mixon. And then I took one more swing at a wide receiver with Dontavian Wicks. The point is basically in the late rounds, when you are taking running backs, you want a lot in volume and different archetypes, rookies, ambiguous backfields, maybe a safe volume projection or two, a couple handcuffs, maybe some upside pieces like a J.K. Dobbins as well. That's kind of how you want to structure your running back core because presumably you're already very strong at the other positions. And if J.K. Dobbins doesn't work out, if Jalen Wright doesn't work out, if Damian Pierce doesn't work out, I cut bait with those guys and I churn the waiver wire at that position. 100% and a very similar build to uh, what I was able to do at the 101 here. Obviously, you're, uh, we're basically showing here that you can do it both at the later portion of your drafts as well as the early portion. You're doing it from the 110. I'm doing it from the 11 here. was able to add CD Lamb with Brandon Ayuk and Nico Collins at that 2-3 turn. Grab my tight end advantage there with Mark Andrews, a guy that's a consistent top 3-5 to five option when he's healthy. George Pickens add another upside piece type of wide receiver. With a guy like George Pickens, he's a guy that's going at the 3-4 turn over on underdog. So we can kind of see the sleeper league ADP here with him going at five, one representing a little bit of value there. Again, a guy that goes continually at the three twelve four Oh one four Oh two with underdog, typically spotting those type of values that are different in your home leagues are type of valuations you want to make. So with George Pickens, happy with him there. Kyler Murray as my quarterback, my anchor there. Again, a guy that's kind of being devalued by the overall market because he was coming off of his ACL injury last season, but a lot to be excited about with the addition of Marvin Harrison and with him being fully healthy entering this year. So I do view him as a quarterback edge as well. Rasheed Rice, again, a guy that fell a little bit in the offseason because of some uncertainty about his suspension status, a guy that is expected to enter the season without any type of suspension. So Getting him here at the 7-1 does feel like a good amount of value. Rounding out my running back core there, Jalen Warren, Tajay Spears, Blake Corum, Rico Dattle, uh, Ty Chandler, and Audrick Esme. Good chunk of a mix between a steady floor of overall volume, along with some upside, some league-breaking upside. Guy like Jalen Warren, Tajay Spears, the efficiency they bring. Blake Corum obviously working behind Kyron Wilms, kind of your volume guy. Rico Dattle, some upside there. We know Zeke, Zeke Elliott is an older running back that – quite frankly, hasn't been the most efficient. So maybe Dowdle is able to take over the majority role in Dallas, along with, of course, Ty Chandler, efficient last year, working behind an injury-prone running back like Aaron Jones, and Audrick Estime, a guy that has really been tearing up that Denver Broncos camp. So love rounding out that core. Do add a final wide receiver there with Jalen Polk. Again, another guy that has been making ways this offseason. So. But I do think we ace the challenge of being able to build a zero running back team. Yeah, and I think it's actually really nice that Sleeper did this for us, but there's actually two examples of what not to do at Team 3 and Team 4 because they they started well, right? They did structurally yeah. what we did, which was like Justin Jefferson, Drake London, Stephon Diggs, Tank Dell as the first four wide receivers. They grabbed some elite onesies there with Kelsey and Prescott, Kincaid and Burrow. But what you don't want to do is draft a second quarterback, draft a second tight end, and not come out of the draft with enough swings at running back where you get Zamir White and Trey Benson or you get Ramondre Stevens and Zach Moss, but you want to keep swinging right? Because you only need two of these guys to start every single week, realistically, because your flexes are going to be occupied by wide receivers most of the time. But you want to make as many swings as possible because it is hard to hit on late round running backs. You want to get this year's Raheem Mostert. You want to get this year's Gus Edwards. You want to get this year's Zach Moss, get this year's Kyron Williams. So that is what you're doing with those late round swings. You don't want to waste them on quarterback and tight end. Cause if you miss on Burrow or Prescott or Kincaid or Kelsey, your early round quarterbacks and tight ends, guess what? You're screwed anyway. So there's no point of really swinging on more quarterbacks and tight ends later on in the draft. You should be swinging primarily on running backs and maybe another wide receiver like you and I did. 
Yeah, 100 percent But uh overall, again, there are a lot of wrong ways to do a zero running back draft strategy. If you guys want the optimal way to do it, this is more so what your team should be looking like once you do it. Yep, absolutely. So again, if you want all of our player takes, all of our information in terms of who you should be drafting and things of that nature, that is available in our draft guide. You can get the link for that down below in the description and in the pinned comment. You can get it for free when you sign up on Underdog Fantasy with code FSE, and you'll also get bonus to play on the site. You'll get a special pick em entry on the site. So make sure to hit that link down below in the description. Again, if you already do have an underdog account, you can get our draft guide on flockfantasy.com. Tons of other bonus content on there as well. A couple draft guides from the other creators. You have dynasty trade calculator, team reviews, the ability to ask us start set questions and trade questions and things of that nature. So check that out down below as well. Hopefully you enjoyed this breakdown of the zero RB. We're going to be breaking down hero RB later in the week, double hero RB later in the week. So definitely stick around and subscribe to make sure you stay tuned for all that. If you made it to the end of this video, hit the like button down below, comment down below what you thought of this breakdown. Who are your favorite zero RB targets? You can comment down below as well. Some of ours, you guys saw Tajay Spears, Chase Brown, Jalen Warren, Brian Robinson, guys like that. You definitely want to be knowing exactly which running backs to target when you're executing this strategy. So with that being said, peace out and we'll talk to you soon.